Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have legendary inspirational athlete BJ Bedford Miller. She's an Olympic gold medalist, former world record holder at the 2000 Sydney Olympics for the 400 medley relay. She's two-time world champion, eight-time US national champion, two-time Pan American Games champion, and the list goes on and on. Wow, you could be witness, witnessing one of the greatest relays in history right now with the way they're going to break this world record. This is an incredible swim. Susie O'Neill is doing a great job of putting Australia for a solid server, but this is all USA. And how appropriate is it that Dara Torres swims the final leg? An amazing comeback, retired from the sport, for seven years, as you take look a look line. at the world record line, <laughs> it's way back there. Dara wow. Torres out of retirement and into the Olympic play for the fourth time, and the Americans are going to absolutely obliterate the world record. Wow. They're under four minutes. And the line just touched. Gold again for the American women. And the 13th world record set at these games. There's B.J. Bedford. B.J. Bedford. Air oh. white and blue. She got it off to a great start. Winning that first leg. May have won the fastest foot in history on her breast. Jenny Thompson, a solid 57 2. And then Derek Torres, who just got out of the 50 freestyle final. She goes 53 plus. Look at B.J. Well, I thought they were going to break into a little break dance there. <laughs> Bedford made the Olympics rally last month at her fourth try. Wow. Can you imagine that? And to get here and win a medal at age 27, we talked about all the medals that Torres and Thompson have, but talk about a sweet Olympic moment for B.J. Bedford. Well, I mean, uh, the end of the race was absolutely... Spectacular. You can see the girls cheering them on, cheering uh, Dara Torres on. And when she touched, and to realize under four minutes, Dan, can you, you know, in this sport, you just don't see that very much. Three seconds, that's just mind boggling. But you know, they had that capability. If they just put together all their best times, that's what it added up to. And they just did that. Four perfect swims for the American women. So the standings. And the 4x100 medley relay, the United States takes out the world record in a huge way. Australia finishes second, and Japan gets the bronze. 16-year-old Megan Kwan there, second from the left, is the babe there among the seasoned veterans. Bedford, Thompson, and Torres, in all probability, have swam their last Olympic race. DJ, thank you so much for joining me. Jeremy, thank you for having me on your show. It was a... Uh... Surprising to be contacted after, you know, 14 years since I've been a, an athlete. <laughs> You're still legendary. Oh, uh, well, yeah, in my own mind. <laughs> yes. And I always like to include a fun fact. I mean, really, what I wanted to talk to you about, many things, but how do we become best in the world? You know, I'm constantly asking myself that about the things, and I think everyone, it's such a, a question that everyone should ask about themselves. And so we'll get into that, but I always like to include a fun fact. And a fun fact about you is the U.S. Swimming created a rule in the rule book because of you. Yes, that's true. Um, I can't remember which nationals it was, but I think it was um, 93 or 90. Anyway, uh, I was doing the 200-meter backstroke, and the before you do the backstroke, you have to get into the water. And so the starter said, please, ladies, enter the water. And I, uh, you have to enter feet first. So I did a back flip and got into the water feet first. And then I did my race. And then afterward, I had like three officials at the end of my lane all angry that I had done a back flip. But I hadn't actually broken any rules. So then the next year, they made a rule in the USA Swimming Handbook saying that you can't actually uh, do flips. You have to jump feet first into the water. So... So were you that good that you could, and other people go feet first and you could just do a backflip and still catch up to them? Oh, no, no, no. It wasn't like get take your mark, go, and then I did a backflip. Oh. It was ladies, enter the water feet first, and then oh, take gotcha. your mark, go, right? So I did, I entered the water feet first, but I did a backflip because I was just playing and having fun because that was kind of the way I did things. 
What else did you do that the way you do things was fun? Because when I was doing the research, you always see, you know, obviously you in this dyed hair. You were always kind of, I don't know, pushing the limits, but definitely, you know, had your own personality. How else yeah. did that, that manifest? That's an interesting question. So, um, yes, I... For me, the most important thing is to be present in your life, to really experience everything that the world has for you in that moment. And there was a, a sense in me always that I could wake up tomorrow and none of it would be possible anymore. You know, I mean, you could break your leg or um, something could happen. Like with my good friend Amy Van Dyken, she was in an ATV accident and, bro and yeah. the next thing you know, she's in a wheelchair. So for me, I really try to focus on enjoy today. Today is what all you have. So I, I that's just kind of my personality. I tend to laugh at things, especially myself. Um, and if there was a way to make it more fun and entertain the people who are around me, I kind of did that too. <laughs> yeah, I think I saw pictures of you doing karaoke after the Olympics or during the Olympics yes. or something yeah. like that. Um, I'm not good at it, but it is very fun. <laughs> So going back to that, the influences, you know, something in your upbringing, how you thought, you know, made you appreciate things. What was it, who was a big influence for you? What was it like growing up? Um, so I think I took my influences very quickly from my family. Uh, my mom is a, an amazing woman who is a, a great uh, parent and leader. And my three brothers all swam, and so I wanted to be just like them. And you know, they climbed trees, I climbed trees. They rode bikes, I rode bikes. They, you know, whatever it was that they were doing, I did it. Um, and I was really lucky that my family was a swimming family because I think, had we been, you know, soccer players, I I wouldn't be talking to you here today because I don't run very well. <laughs> but you know, I mean, I think for me, my inspirations were initially my brothers, and then I had a lot of great coaches, and um, there are some incredible women athletes out there who were always inspiring. So what was it like growing up with three brothers? <laughs> uh, I got really loud and really fast. So I could yell mom while running as my brothers were trying to catch me. Or <laughs> and uh, I also got really flexible because we would all wrestle, and they would pin me down and do the spitty game where they spit and they pull it up right before it hits your face. <laughs> um, so I, I think I got a, maybe a bizarre warped sense of like what's normal. <laughs> but I could take a pounding, I could take a beating, yeah. and, uh, just keep coming back and never giving up. And uh, it was the only way I'd ever win is just to tire my brothers out. <laughs> Do you think that helps you in your journey to have three older brothers just beating up on you? Um, yes. So uh, let's see. The first national title I ever won, I think it was 1991. Um, I came home from nationals like all psyched, like, woo, I won nationals. My brother Charles looks at me. Uh, he's six years older than I am, and he goes, so you think you're better than me now? <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> and so then the beating ensued. And yeah. uh, I, I, you know, it was either that or I would like scream, "Mom, Charles hit me!" and run away before he hit me. And then it was like he was hell bent on hitting me because if he was going to get in trouble for it, he was going to get the satisfaction of doing it. So it's, it's nothing like three brothers to humble you, I'm sure. Right? Yeah, very much so. So, BJ, when did you discover that you had this this talent? You know, when I was probably 11 years old, I remember sitting. Slack jawed on the, you know, crisscross applesauce, as my, I tell my kids today, on the living room floor watching the Olympics in 1984 and just thinking, Mom, someday that's going to be me. And uh, I, I told her that. And I, you know, I think that's the dream that everybody starts with. And I, there are so many lucky reasons why it happened to me. But I, I definitely think that you got to start with the dream. Um, and then I loved the water, I just loved to swim. Um, and I, I loved the social aspect of it, if you can believe that putting your face in water and swimming away can actually give you a social outlet. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the wall. <laughs> and so I had a lot of friends there, and it was what my brothers did, and again, I wanted to be like them. So what point in your life that you were like, wow, I'm so much better than the other people? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I... I, first of all, I grew up in New Hampshire, and uh, Jenny Thompson also grew up in New Hampshire, and she's about six months younger than I am. So I never suffered from the delusion that I was the best in the world, right? Because Jenny Thompson could always beat me, um, and she's an incredible athlete. So 
there, that and I always compared myself to my brothers, right? So I didn't always, I didn't really think of myself as better than everybody else. Um, I thought of myself as, oh, I'm going to beat my brother, right? <laughs> Which I actually ended up doing his uh, junior year in college or senior year in college. My 100 backstroke time beat his 100 backstroke time. And he then uh, called me and said he's never doing backstroke again. <laughs> he used to have a Division three college. Um, but I, I made like the top 10 in New England when I was 8 years old. And so at that point, I knew I was, I was pretty good. And then I made junior nationals when I was 14. And then that meant that I could swim in, that I could go to a meet in Florida. So I got to go with my dad down to Florida and swim in a meet in Florida. Like I got to go on a trip because I was swimming. So for me, I think the positive reinforcement just kept it going. And I didn't really, um, you know, aside from that first four brush with greatness after my first national title where my brother beat the crap out of me. <laughs> I don't think I ever really thought of myself as a whole lot better than everybody else. Yeah. So when did you start training really hard? How young were you? Mm -hmm. uh, so I started training uh, really, really hard when I got to Petty, which is in Heightstown, New Jersey, right outside of Princeton. Um, my high school, I went to private school there, um, and we had Nelson Diebel on the team, who was an Olympic gold medalist in 1992, two golds. We had Royce Sharp on the team who held an American record. This is a bunch of ragtag high school kids. Uh, great coach, Chris Martin, who we affectionately referred to as Satan Lord of Darkness. Um, he was a very, very hard coach. But he, uh, it, the whole thing, that group of kids was absolutely amazing. They trained seven days a week. I had come from swimming three days a week. Um, and the fact just how... It was the first place I had ever been where there was positive peer pressure, meaning the, when I first got there, the fast people were in lane one, and then the good, really fast people were in lane two. Lane three was like pretty decent, pretty good. Lane four was kind of getting into the scrub world is what they called us. <laughs> and then five and six were like the eighth graders and freshmen. <laughs> and I was in lane four because I was so intimidated by all these people who just worked so hard. And they were fine with me hanging out over there until, like, uh, I set the school record the first meet of the season or something, and, man, were they mad at me. Like, you, you, don't, you don't deserve that. You don't work hard. You know, compared to them, I didn't. But for me, I worked my butt off. Actually showing up in a pool five or six days a week was amazing for me. So um, it, was a, it was a really amazing environment to be in with, as I said, positive peer pressure. I'd never seen that before. Before it's all like, hey, let's skip practice. Woo! This was like, if you don't go to practice, then we're not talking to you for like a week. And that, that was the worst punishment because I'm social. And if you don't talk to me, I get really sad. <laughs> now, with that, what did the, um, actually, the days look like you know, for the training, for swimming at that point? Well, um, we had classes on Saturdays, we had classes on Fridays, so it was half days on Wednesdays and Saturdays, and then um, regular school days, and again, it was a boarding school, so I was in New Jersey, living in the dorms, uh, my junior and senior year in high school, so we would, um, mornings, you get up, at, I mean, it wasn't every morning, uh, we had practice every afternoon, um, but the mornings were, I think, from 6 to 7.15 or something, and we did dry land for part of it, and then we did... Um, uh, swimming for you know 45 minutes. We didn't actually do it that long, but um, Chris, the our coach, we had um, one like Christmas break or a break of four weeks or something, and he made us swim with shoes on, sneakers. Really? Oh yeah, uh, and it was a four week group a grouping of we were going to train with shoes on, and if you've ever swum with shoes on. It, it is not, not on purpose. <laughs> no, it, like you, your body goes like this. Like normally swimming, you want to go sh like a shark, right? Like straight through the water. You don't see snow plows going through it. Well, that's what you look like when you're swimming with shoes on. And we had four weeks of training, and his whole thing, he sat us down at the beginning and said, mm, the second week of training, you're going to do a one-hour straight swim with shoes on. Wow. The third week, you're going to do a two-hour straight swim with shoes on. We don't know when it's going to happen. It's just going to happen on one of the days. And then the fourth week, guess what? Three-hour straight swim with shoes on. At some point, we don't know when it's going to be. Well, Chris loved Royce the most. 
because Royce worked so... Royce had his own keys to the pool because he would get there early and just do backstroke starts. He was amazing. Um, so Royce snuck into the pool on the day he... Chris told Royce when the three-hour straight swim was shoot, with shoes on was. He snuck in. He stole my $5 keds that I had gotten from Walmart being like, I don't want to swim with shoes on and replaced them with men's size 13 high tops. So I did a three-hour straight swim with men size 13 high tops on because, and Ray still doesn't admit this, but I know that it was him. He stole my kids. He replaced them with high tops. I'm and I send this to him. So oh, yeah. Make him fess up. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> he probably is like, I didn't do it, but he, I know it was him. And he stole, I had men, these massive shoes that are like this he, giant shoes that I had to swim with. And I remember I cried for the first hour and a half doing it, just like, do another stroke. <laughs> do another stroke. <laughs> just, it was awful. And the whole time, my coach, Chris, was at the end of the pool like, yeah, PJ. And I was so mad because I was so slow. And it was so, oh, it was so bad. It was so awful. Was I don't even know how that would stay on your feet. Oh, yeah, you'd lay some. Uh, I mean, if yeah, they, I mean, just. I don't know. He would have thrown a kickboard at my head if my shoes had fallen off. So what other techniques or, th or crazy things do they make you do to toughen you up and make you better? Um, well, I'll tell you, nothing was as tough as what Petty was. <laughs> uh, I went to college, and I swam for Mark Schubert, who was pretty renowned for being a really tough coach. And I remember him saying, you know, we're going to do a T30, timed 30-minute 30, 30 swim, and being like, well, I'll go first. <laughs> like, that's all? 30 minutes? Yeah, I'll go. <laughs> Like, I was a sprinter, and I was like, yeah, I'll do that. And everyone else was like, no. Um, I think the hardest thing, uh, I was a little bit of a, um, an unruly youth. Shocking, I know. Um, but I would occasionally get in trouble for sneaking out of the dorm to go get donuts or something like that. <laughs> we get locked down. You know, you're 17, you're 16 years old. Uh, it's good. You should be on lockdown. Now that I'm a parent, I believe that. Uh, but back then, I wasn't. It's that probably sure. gonna come. Is it gonna come back around? You're gonna get uh, the same medicine that you gave. You know, my mom did give me the curse of I hope you have one just like you. I think it's the boy, though. I'm not sure. I think the girl looks like me, but I think my son got more of that like sneaky little. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, I remember I, I snuck out of the dorm and. Uh, Chris had this thing he called group insurance. And if you did something wrong, you didn't necessarily get the punishment. Mm. You had to stand there and watch while everyone else did the punishment and stared at you and shot daggers at you and made you want to die. So I remember uh, watching the team do an 8,000 IM because I had snuck out of the dorms. That That's a good fun. way. That's a good deterrent. Yeah. It, it really... I mean, I, everyone at my work, I work at a software company, and everybody kind of makes fun of me because I'm like, dude, one team, one dream. We are, what, like, team. I am all team, but I didn't get that, but that way by choice. <laughs> Since you were 11, did you have a internal mantra that you said, kind of like what you were just talking about? Because you, your dream at that point, you said, was when you saw that, you're like, that's going to be me one day. Yeah, I think... My, my mantras uh, kind of changed based on my life circumstance. Uh, you know, at Texas, we had some things we'd say, like Orange Tower 91 for Light Tower Orange when we you win a national championship as a team. So that was a big thing then, Orange Tower, and then whatever year it was. Um, and then when I swam for the resident team in Colorado Springs, we were, you know, six people. So we didn't have a whole lot of team stuff going on. And really, it became very much about um, maintaining very few things in my head when I was actually swimming. Um, I focused very, I got really OCD on how many strokes I was taking in practice and um, technique. I got really drilled in on technique when I was training there. But in the race, I was, if I had too many things going through my head, I was lost. I would screw myself up. So I'd really try to just be like, okay, dive in 11 kicks, and then if not think anything, if I started thinking, then my brain would get in the way. My body knew what to do. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the only mantras I would have would be sort of at the end of a race when when it's close, when you really want it, and you just think, "This is my race. I got this. This is my," you know, just something along those lines, like kick. <laughs> Really simple. <laughs> like I <laughs> tell to a baby, kick. <laughs> um, so what, you know, obviously you had a lot of successes. What are some of the biggest challenges that you ran up against and how you actually overcame them? You know, I think with everything, your biggest challenge is yourself, uh, or at least in my case. I mean, and there are definitely circumstances that you can't avoid. People will occasionally um, run into circumstances. But I found that I really created most of my circumstances. And the issues that I faced were more issues that I either made up or didn't deal with well enough or something like that. Sorry, my nose is itchy. Um, but I, I think that the biggest challenge I always faced was me. Um, and, and I would say the monkey on my back for most of the time was the Olympic trials because I was on the U.S. national team from 1989 till 2001, which is 12 years. I made one Olympic team in that time. And I would be on every team until the Olympic trials, and then I would just choke. I just I would close up. I'd get so scared that I wasn't going to make the team that it became the only thing that could happen. It was the only thing in my head. And um, for me to make the team in 2000 was... It, it was just a huge release. I mean, I and it was such a culmination of so many people's efforts, not just mine. I mean, I happened to be the one who got to swim in the pool, but my coaches, my family, my friends, everybody kind of walked with me painfully at times through that experience to get me there. So I'd say that the biggest challenge, how did I get through it? Um, I don't think anybody achieves their dreams by themselves. I think the secret to achieving your great dreams and doing great things is surrounding yourself with people who believe in those dreams more than you do because you won't believe in them every day. And I had phenomenal coaches. I had phenomenal teammates. I had people who would bring me up when I couldn't, and that made all the difference. So tell me about the 2000 Olympic trials when you made the team. Um, it was a crazy meet. Olympic trials is the, the best and worst meet ever. Um, you always know somebody and are cheering with all your heart for somebody to make the team that you love, and they do, or they don't, right? So it's, it's the pinnacle and it's the, the, the abyss. So you, in, in 92, I watched my best friend make the team, and I didn't make it. So I was seated number two in the, in the U.S., and I watched Nelson, my best friend in the world from high school, win the 100 breaststroke, go to the Olympics, win, win in a, a, he was amazing. So my heart is like overflowing with joy for him and just yeah. crushed that it, well, I wasn't there with him. Uh, 96, same thing. I mean, 96, gosh, I shaved my head for the Olympic trials like a crazy idiot. Um, and then I, I remember Christine Quantz and I were always roommates. And she was like, okay, when you make the team, because she made the team. She's like, when you make it, we'll room together. And I didn't make it. And it's like, yeah, I was so happy for her and so crushed for myself. And then in 2000, I made it, and she didn't. And I was like, Christine, you've got to make it so we can be roommates, you know. And um, it's just, uh, it is such an emotional event. Um, and for me, it was... It was a roller coaster for sure. I, I almost took myself out by getting too stressed out, and then um, I got a great big hug, hug from my high school swim coach who snuck down from the stands. So he was in the stands. He snuck down and hid behind the great big curtains that you see in Indianapolis. There's these ceiling, like, I don't know, 100 feet. <laughs> Maybe it's not 100 feet, but it was really tall. These great big curtains, and this man is like six foot four, African American. He stands out on a pool deck, like you, he's real hard to hide. So he <laughs> ended up hiding behind this, the the uh, curtains there, and I saw his arm out, like hey. And I was like, oh my god, Chris! And he just got me in this great big bear hug when I was freaking out. I was totally nervous, and he got me in. You know when you get in a hug and you don't really want to have a hug? Think back to when you were a kid. You get the hug and your like aunt grabs you and you can't move your arms. You're like, Aah! it was like one of those. <laughs> he got me before I even had a chance to reach out. And uh, 
he told me a story about Nelson, and I can't remember what the story was, but I just remember struggling for a little bit and then realizing about 30 or 40 seconds in to this hug, like that's the longest hug you'll ever get, right? Um, and, and just all of it faded away, the fear, the stress, the anxiety, everything that I was feeling just faded away, and I was like, oh, it's just a swim meet. I can do this. I've done this. And it was like just that ended up being the thing that I needed, which is why I say I, nobody does this alone. I didn't do it alone. Um, it took my high school swim coach to come down from the stands and like get me in an attack hug to get me to realize who I am. Because yeah. I think, and that's why <laughs> you're saying, what do you say to yourself? I just try not to talk to myself because it's not friendly in there. Yeah, that's powerful. <laughs> And, I mean, you have to be really persistent because you work so hard yeah. the whole year and there's this one meet. Yeah. How do you stay, I mean, year after year after year, what in your mind creates that persistence? Because you could just easily say, you know what, after four years, five years, six years, okay, I've, I've done enough, I've tried. What yeah. kept you going, persisting? So I think with anything that's a long-term goal, right, like you climb Mount Everest, you don't look at Everest, you don't look at the peak, you look at your feet, and you have little things along the way that you do, I mean, and little things, by little things, I'm talking about world championships, you know, Pan American Games, Pan Pacific Games, World Goodwill Games, great opportunities to travel the world, um, so for me, that was always a driver um, to get to go see new places and experience new things, like that was, that was so fun for me and something I'm really passionately in love with. Um, another thing about it for me personally, and I know for a lot of people who start a sport really young, is it became who I was. It, you know, oh, BJ and sw swimming. BJ is a swimmer, and you know, even if you think about how people self-identify, I I thought of myself as a swimmer to the point where you get pretty lost without it sometimes. And you think of even now, if I wake up in the early morning, sometimes I'll feel like, oh my gosh, I'm late for practice. I'm 41 years old. I haven't been to swim practice <laughs> in 20 years, right? Like, I, you got to be kidding me. But I still am like, oh. So it's it's just something that became ingrained in you. Yeah, like it really was me. So um, to walk away was more painful than to stay, you know. So I think that um, at least there, I knew who I was. Um, and you know, I think a lot of athletes go through that when they stop doing their sport, like NFL football players and especially these unheralded Olympic sports, um, I think you, you pour so much of your life into it and then for what may or may not be a success. And uh, you were talking about it earlier and I, I always joke around to people, I'm like, yeah, I trained for 23 years for one minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, you do. You, you give yourself things along the way to hit and you identify with the process, and it can't be a thing that you get at the end. It, it really can't. It can't be like, oh, I got my medal, and now bye-bye. Um, it's really, and the people who have them, you talk to Summer Sanders, you talk to you know, Janet Evans, you talk to um, some of the, you know, even probably Michael Phelps, and I haven't talked to Michael to ask him, but very rarely are those medals somewhere shown somewhere, because once you get there, you realize that none of it's real, right? Like you think you're going to be this two-dimensional poster, right? Like it's all going to be perfect. You, you, and you know rationally it's not going to be, I'm, not, I'm still going to wake up and be me, but somewhere in your head you're like, well, I'm going to be on the Wheaties box, and I know it has to happen for someone, like why not me? And, but it, it, you know, inevitably it doesn't, and even if it does, well, who are you the next day? Are you still you? So I think that there's just a lot of introspection that kind of goes along the process. And I don't know that I answered your question. I just went off on a little journey there. <laughs> I like your answer. Yeah, I like your answer. It, you know, what makes me think is this, BJ. I was thinking a lot about what questions do I ask someone who is best in the world. And one thing is kind of what you're saying about the, the voices in your head aren't always the good voices. And cool. I'm thinking... Cool. How I think that would overtake me, thinking, okay, hundredths of a second make a difference. Like every single just instant makes a difference in this race. And you said you just try and get it out of your head. What were some of the techniques you used? Because I think this goes with work, business, parenting, mm -hmm. 
sports. How did you get those you know voices out of your head so that yeah. you could just say kick, 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 kick? Well, um, practice. <laughs> but I, I would say the first and foremost is just don't go in there. It's not friendly. Come out here where people love you, right? Like <laughs> inside is not the place where love abounds necessarily. Well, when you're swimming, I mean that's all you have at that moment, right? Um, I mean you're you're just you in the, the water. I lost myself in the technical pieces of it, right? Um, and even now if I'm going through something that's really challenging um, with my kids or family or something like that, like I'll, if I find a pool and just count my strokes, somehow the, the rest of my brain can fall into place so it all somehow makes a line. Like it may not be straight, but at least it gives me kind of, it helps me to um, create that path. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know, maybe it's almost like my meditation, but it's really, it, it's funny, each lap has its own challenge, right? If I can get to the, the right level of challenges, 10 strokes a lap. Okay, how do I get to 10 strokes a lap? Um, like 10 and a half, 11, I need to kick more. I need, so it's really like engaging myself in a fluid, if you will, um, discourse with the water that allows me to use my brain in a way that focuses and creates a, a, an immediate goal and an immediate response and then from there, I tend to lose, I, I, it gives me perspective again. Like you ever stand at the foot of a 14,000 foot peak and think, okay, my problems aren't really that big. Yeah. So that's kind of what swimming does for me. So what have been the biggest turning points in your career that you consider? Oh, yeah, I read that question that you sent me beforehand, and I have a good story to tell on that one. So, um, right, well, there, there have been a few. Um, Certainly the Olympic trials in 1996 when I didn't make the team and I shaved my head and then I had to look in the mirror every day after that and be like, you look like a tennis ball and an idiot. Like, what were you thinking? <laughs> um, so that was a big one. <laughs> but I went to the U.S. Open um, in 1996 prior to the Olympic trials. Or maybe it was like October, maybe it was 95, but it was either late 95 or early 96. And um, my, my back, my Hunter backstroke was just my best event kept inching and inching and inching, going slower and slower. And I'm like, this this can't be happening. Like, not right now. This is this is when I need it to be good. Like, I need to be getting better. What? And I was freaking out. And I remember go, I did um, the prelim race of the 100 backstroke, and I swam so slow, and it hurt so bad. And I was so mad. And I went up to my coach, Jaunty, who's South African, and uh I was like, Jaunty, am I ever going to swim fast again? It was so dramatic. And uh, he looked at me and goes, barring a miracle, not tonight. <laughs> I was like, I hate you. I was so mad. Not what you want to hear. <laughs> he kicked me in the butt so hard with that just one little comment. I was like, ah! And um, I went back to my hotel room, and I just sat there, and I was like, all right, I'm going to have to figure it Like, how am I going to? get my head out of this because my again like what you were talking about this was not helping me how do I get my head out of this because I was racing Lee Maurer who was the best she was the American record holder she was there she and I had this rivalry so I always wanted to beat her and I think I was making it more about everyone else and as soon as you start making it about other people you are screwed you're in trouble you're not gonna win you're gonna completely fall on your face and so I resolved at that point that I was, I, I remember saying, looking at the lane, saying, I'm going to draw two lines underneath the lane lines down. Like, this is my own pool. I don't care what anybody else does. I'm going to have my race, and it's going to be right here. And um, maybe it's a testament to my own mental fortitude, if I, I can even say that. But I, I didn't win the race that night. Lee actually won. Um, but I swam a lot better. And I swam a good race, and I turned it around, and I started getting faster at that point somehow. And I'd, it's got to be mental, right? Like It's not like my physicality was deteriorating. I was in the best shape of my life. Um, so it was really, <laughs> oh, I hope that uh, none of my bosses ever watch this, because they'll be like, oh, I see how to get through to you. <laughs> <laughs> Say mean things to her, it helps. <laughs> 
Well, maybe you not mean, but realistic. <laughs> so you said there was another turning point? Well, the, I would say that was the Olympic That was trials. a big one. Because um, yeah. in 96, I ended up, uh, I quit for about six months and um, started working. And I had an art history degree, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And uh, I started tending bar. There were a couple of times when I had some conversations with some bar flies who would look at me and be like, what are you doing here? This is not the place for you. And um, I do remember kind of being struck by that. Being like, yeah, there's something else for me. I don't know what it is, but there's something else. And then just watching people drink themselves to death was really horrible. <laughs> I was like, I need to do something else. Did you, speaking of that, and you said you stuck out for donuts before, Did <laughs> you? were you on a strict diet? Like how strict mm -hmm. was the, the regimen of, of the diet they had you on? Or that you had uh, yourself on? I did not have a diet at all. Uh, my diet was eat as much as I could uh, and try to continue to eat. <laughs> we burned so many calories. Uh, I was I was joking around with somebody at work the other day, and I was like, "Yeah, we um, we pretty much said I, I'm gonna eat as much as I possibly can. This is my large pizza. You want pizza? You order your own pizza. This is mine. You can't have any. If you want some pizza, you order your own. <laughs> like I would eat a whole large pizza in a sitting." Yeah. There's no way. I could eat two pieces now. Well, I could eat three. I probably should eat two. <laughs> um, I mean, were there anything in your diet regimen, like certain vitamins that you made sure you took, or certain drinks, or you just whatever? I need, if it didn't move off of my plate, I would eat it. <laughs> I ate a lot. We, we did try to do, like, go, like, little um, after-workout snacks and things like that. But, I mean, we really was err on the side of more food. And less on, I mean, we did some uh, nutritional an analysis stuff at the Olympic Training Center, and it was really like, well, you're eating enough here and here and here, but you need more of this. Like, you need more vitamin, blah. Um, so it was never like, you know, dietary, eat more, eat fewer uh, carbohydrates and more protein, or do this kind of shake, or it was none of that stuff. It was like, uh, are you getting enough iron? Can you eat more steak? <laughs> So I yeah I ate all the time. Yeah. Bj, and since this is inspired insider, you know I want to ask, um, what's the most painful moment mm. that you had to overcome, and and walk us through kind of what happened and your thinking. Um, so I, I created all the most painful moments. I would say, uh, <laughs> I would I think that the most painful moment was going into Olympic trials, and and the hundred backstroke in 1996. I was seated number one in two events going into the, the Olympic trials. I got third place in the 100 back, and you have to be first or second to make the team. I knew I wasn't going to make the team before the race. Like, I knew. And all I could think about was, are they still going to like me if I don't make it? I mean, that's when, as I said, you go into the your brain, and it's just the, the black box in there. You, it's not a fun place when you when you let it run rampant, right, if you don't have some people to pull you out. Um, but I, I remember walking up to Whitney Hedgepeth, who Whitney and I were on the same team. She qualified in the 100 back that year. And being like, Whitney, no matter what happens, like, we'll always be friends. And she just, I think she just kind of looked at me like, whatever, BJ, duh. But for me, I was really, like, there's a, a really raw, scared, sad piece of me that was, Frightened that if I didn't do this, people wouldn't love me. And the only person who wasn't going to love me was me. Um, and I didn't. You know, I, I, I missed that team, and it crushed me. I didn't even make the final in the 200 backstroke, which was the other event that I was ranked number one in the country. Um, I, I fell apart after that. It was a really dark time. Um, and that's when I, 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 was, I drank a lot. I started doing the bartending job. And then, you know, there, as I said, there were a few people who kind of would pull me aside and be like, what, what are you doing? This isn't you, you know, and maybe it was the worst reflection of me. Um, and I was in a relationship that wasn't working. Um, so it was really just, and, and that was probably not the relationship's fault, but more, again, me bringing the negativity and all of that darkness to it. Um, I remember at that point I got an, a piece of paper from USA Swimming that said, 
um, if you're interested in the resident team, check this box. And I was thinking, well, it's a good way to sort of kind of keep up with what's going on. It's an interesting thing. I wasn't thinking they would ask me to come and be part of it. I really thought it was just a way to tertiary, be tertiarily, if that's even a word, <laughs> involved with the sport without doing what I was doing. Um, and then I got a phone call from John D. Skinner, who said, uh, I'd like you to come and try out for this team. When I, I, I perked up, and I think I went out there because he said, I'd like you to come try out. Like, and there was a piece of me that was like, what do you mean try out? You're not just asking me to be on the team because uh, you should just be asking me. <laughs> It's so funny you have like the dichotomy of the feeling so low and insignificant and yet I'm like, oh, I'm so significant. <laughs> so I flew out there and I had a conversation with Jaunty. Well, he had me swim for a while. He filmed me underwater and then he, uh, he pulled me into his office. He got, get your towel, come sit here. And he watched the film and he looked and goes, I think I can help you. And it was really weird. It wasn't like, it wasn't a rah-rah speech. It was really looking at the technique and the dynamics of what I was doing underwater. And he said, yeah, I think, I think I can make you faster. Like, I think I can help you. And that was what he had meant by the, the trial. Like, he wanted to see if I was technically perfect and if maybe I had gotten to the very best that I could be. I see. And it, I hadn't. And he said, you know, tell me about what you want to do. And at that point, I found myself saying things like, I just want to go to the Olympics. I just want to, I just want to achieve this dream and, and um, you know, some things like that. And uh, <laughs> typical John T. style. He's a very uh, mumbly South African. Blah, 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 blah. Um, I remember him saying, well, I'm a sucker for a dream. And, and that was it. I, <laughs> And, uh, and he said, I want you to come here for four years. And this was October of 1996, and I, I was coming off the Olympic trials and watching the super successful Olympics, feeling like my team had left me behind. And uh, I was like, well, I'll give you a year. And if it works, I'll give you another year. And if that works, I'll give you one more. <laughs> I'm like, but I can't commit to four years today at 23 years old, feeling like my life was still halted from entering into the rest of my life. Um, but I think that was, that was again, the most, probably the most painful thing I went through in my professional career. And I, the thing I notice most is that I depend a lot on other people to pull me out. So yeah. I'll reach out oh, for that. Thank you for sharing that. That's, you know, very tough, very tough time. And, you know, when you're going through that, and how do you drop everything? He said, come here for four years. And yeah. what did your schedule look like at that point? Because that's, a, again, a huge commitment for you. Yeah, it was, for it was a lot. Yeah, well, um, my prospects didn't look that great. <laughs> I told you I didn't have, I had a, a kind of a failing relationship. Again, I, I take full responsibility for it because um, I think I was creating the failure. Uh, I had a degree and I was tending bar. <laughs> so I wasn't really, you know, on a, beeline to the moon for my career. <laughs> I was just kind of hanging out in Austin uh, where I'd gone to college and um, kind of not sure what I wanted to do and this was something that really kind of gave me some direction. So um, I, I, my boyfriend at the time and I kind of broke up, kind of didn't, I don't know, it was, it was mishmashy like everything else was in my life at that point. But I drove to uh, to Colorado Springs in my little Pontiac Le Mans, packed to the gills with all of my junk, and they're in the middle of a huge snowstorm on October 21st, 1996. I didn't even make it to the training center. I got to a hotel and pulled off the side of the road because it was like whiteout conditions, and I was coming from Texas. I was like, ah! So uh, yeah, I stayed, got in a hotel and checked into the dorms the next day and started my life. So. What it looked like was practice was every morning from 7 to 9. Um, eat, go take a nap, wake up, uh, weights for from 1.30 to 3.30. And there, by, it wasn't like two hours of lifting weights. I'm a very social weightlifter. 
I would walk around, I would talk to everybody, I would try to pretend to do pull-ups and not do as many, and then my weight, co weight coach, Tony Bellafato, would be like, that was only eight, and I would be like, oh, but it was a big game for me. Um, well, I was actually like 130 to three, and then we'd swim from three to five, and then I'd go home, and you'd do it all over the next day. Yeah. So what's the hardest part about being a professional swimmer? Um, there's no money in it. <laughs> So how did you, I mean, I mean, how was that funded? Because you're basically just training all day. Yeah, so I was actually sponsored by Nike, so Nike helped me a lot. The USOC and the United, and United States Swimming helped with a lot of that. I was living in the dorms, so I didn't have any expenses because the resident team program, is, it exists so that they can take athletes out of life and have them focus entirely on training. So I did that for a few years, and, and I was, um, you had to be top, four in the country for, or top four in the world to get a stipend from USA Swimming if you are the number two American, top six in the world if you are top, if you are the number one American. In any given event, you would qualify for a, I think it was $1,500 a month or something like that with no taxes taken out so you get killed at the end of the year. Um, so, I mean, I didn't spend a whole lot, but I mean, it, that's the thing is it just allows you to really, really focus. but your life is on hold. So if you don't win the Olympics, it's real hard to feel like you didn't just waste four years of your life. You know what I mean? It, the whole world of it conspires to keep you exactly the same. So you go and you live at the Olympic Training Center. They don't want to change a thing. If you're winning, if you're at the World Championships, you're at the Olympics, you're performing at a very high level, they don't want anything to change. They want to keep you exactly the way you are. Um, so they shut out all the distractions, all those things, those horrible moments that make us who we are. They want to make it so those never happen. So um, what ends up happening is you store them all up and then you run into them at the end. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, BJ, you mentioned the beginning of the interview, Amy Van Dyke and Rowan. And yeah. um, she was obviously a friend of yours. When did you first hear about that? Uh, I heard about it um, pretty much right away. Dave Deniston and I are really good friends, and he had something similar happen to him, um, but he had a sledding accident. And, um, yeah, I heard about it really quickly, um, like a day or two after it happened. And, uh, oh, gosh, yeah, it still makes me tear up a little bit. But she's doing awesome. Um, I think one of the things that's really so incredible is the fact that she's going to be able to speak for an entire legion of people who have no one to speak for them. You know, she's, you can't keep Amy quiet. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> so speaking for, as someone who is also very difficult to shut up. <laughs> but I think Amy with a mission is someone who is so powerful and amazing and can bring so much to so many. Um, I think it's, I'm, I'm really sad that this happened to her, but I think she is going to be able to advocate for and have a real purpose for herself um, in a way that I don't think she's had in a while. So I'm really excited for what's next for her. Yeah, and for people who don't know what happened, Amy was a you know, six-time Olympian and uh, she had a spinal cord injury. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She severed her spinal cord when her ATV landed on top of her. She not only severed her spinal cord; she um, she broke eight eight vertebra. Four of them are fused. Two more on the top and two more on the bottom were healing when I went to see her. Um, and then she had also broken, I think, at, at least two, maybe four ribs. I mean, she was. I'm a the the fact that she's alive is a miracle. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I read an article that it was like millimeters from her aorta or something, just crazy. Yeah, really, it's uh, crazy. So, what did you talk to her about? Oh, um, tough yeah. conversation. And you know, Amy is somebody who makes light of everything. So, she talked about all. Well, like we we both love to laugh. Um, so it's probably why we've been friends for a really long time. And uh, so we, we kind of left. I mean, I was texting her, and I was like, uh, how long before I can bring you some wine? Because <laughs> we always will drink wine when we're together. And uh, she's like, 
I go, am I allowed to bring wine? She goes, I'm paralyzed, not brain dead. Do you bring me wine? <laughs> So we are, uh, you know, we it, and she's on a massive concoction of painkillers until she's, um, uh, until everything heals right. And I, I don't know how long that's going to be either. But um, so we didn't actually drink anything. <laughs> she's still healing, but um, we're, uh, yeah. Well, we talked about the different classes she's taking it or she took at Craig, and they have classes on how to be in your life and. Um, all that kind of stuff. I mean, like the the fundamentals. Like, how do you go to the bathroom? How do you, you know, all this stuff that who would ever think about, and why would you ever want to know or ask? So. You have to relearn everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, was it just that. business as usual with her? I mean, when you talked, or was there more of a heart to heart conversation? Too? No, you know, it was. It, I think we both tried to keep it really light because. I mean, the last thing I wanted to do was um, not be strong for her. So I wanted to to show her that that we were I was happy and that you know I didn't think of her any differently. Um, and the thing that was funny that I noticed right away is you know Amy has this horrible accident and um, she's taking care of her friends, like texting us, "Hey, I'm okay," and because I. Oh gosh, Christy Kowal, Dave Denniston, um, you know Nicole Hazlett. We we were all connected, going, oh oh no, oh gosh, you know. And then she's reaching out, saying, hey, you guys, don't worry about me, I got this, you know. And then she's out there taking care of us. And I was like, I couldn't go in there and be like a puddle of mush. Like that just wouldn't be fair to what she's going through. Yeah. Even though as soon as I left, I was like. Ah! <laughs> Understandable, yeah. yeah. So talking about some of the really low points, tell me about the proudest moment. Um, certainly I think the proudest moment is a little cliche, right? I, it was standing on the award stand at the Olympics, um, watching the American flag get slowly raised for something that you did, right? Like you and these, me and these three other women, for a moment in time we were the best in the world. Like, that's amazing. That is, it, it, that should not, it's, it shouldn't exist. <laughs> Statistically, it's impossible, right? Like, but we did it. We did it for one moment. And um, I was recognized in the streets of Sydney as the very emotional girl because I was like, <laughs> just bawling. Um, <laughs> I mean, Megan Kwan had already won the Hunter Breaststroke. Jenny and Dara had more medals than they could carry in their hands. So for me, I was like, this is mine. This is my one. I got it. And I was just so happy and so proud and um, so honored to be standing there with women who will go down in history as the best there ever has been, you know. So yeah. um, but that was so such a – it was really the pinnacle. You know, we could you could hear the crowd. Like, it, if you stand too close to a speaker, you can feel – the sound you could the vibration, I could, yeah. I could feel the crowd through my warm up on my skin because they were so loud. It was it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. It's something I'll never I'll never forget. Yeah, and I before we hopped on the interview, I watched that final race, and yeah. and um, they talked about you for half the the back half is you know what you overcame. You know, she you know wasn't in Olympic trials this year, this year, this year, you know, she just kept at it and she made it for this gold medal so, and they you know, were talking about you. And um, so, you know, obviously you said there's a lot of people who help bring you up. Yeah. Tell me about some of those influential coaches, mentors, what are the advice they gave you mm. in your journey? And you talked about one moment with the, with the high school coach. Yeah. What was another, some great advice you've gotten from your coaches? Well, I think Jaunty was always one to know when to give me a swift kick to get me out of my head. <laughs> um, Mark Schubert was a great coach as well um, in college, and I think he taught me. I, th I feel like each coach, I had the three main coaches I had were Chris Martin in high school, um, Mark Schubert in college, and uh, Jaunty Skinner post college. And and I had some good coaches prior to. There was a guy named Roy Coates at, uh, when I was a, a little kid who really kind of started me on the path of, of being really good. And uh, But Chris was someone who taught me the value of hard work, like what 
mo like hard work is money in the bank. That's what he always used to tell us. It's money in the bank, and even if you don't take it out today, you're gonna get that back. You just you gotta wait it out. You don't know when it's gonna happen, and we're gonna we're gonna try to make it happen at the right time for you. You don't know, but we'll do our best, right? Um, and then uh, I think the what I learned in college from Mark Schubert was class. You learn how to win and lose gracefully because we won my freshman year. We won NC2As. Our, our team um, set the record for the most points ever scored. It was amazing. We had such an incredible team. And then um, the next year and the year after and the year after, we got second, third, and second. So I remember um, you, in the locker room prior to, or in the, our team meeting prior to finals, on the last day of NC2As, and we knew we wouldn't win. Uh, we was we were out of it. We couldn't. We could, even if they if the Stanford fall started everything, we still you know it it would be take that kind of a miracle for us to win. Um, I remember him saying, you know, you ladies have performed with class and grace, and um, just like that message was was so acute and so important. And then our team captains, Dorsey Tierney and uh, Katie Aris, saying, this is going to be hard, but every single one of us is going to stand up there, and we are going to clap for, those, for the other women. And we do not cry. Do not let those cameras catch you. If you're going to cry, you go into the locker room. You do not do it out in front of people. This, nobody needs that drama. And I remember just the pride in, uh, in that team was really, really poignant. And then, I mean, Jonti, he taught me that it was, it was, you can overcome by, by focus, you know, with really, um, you know, I just remember he was not going to let me fail. He just would not. Like, he, over his dead body, would I screw myself up. <laughs> I just remember uh, I would call him. We both lived up in uh, Black Forest in Colorado Springs, which is, uh, like 8,000 feet. It's super high up in altitude. And I'd be like, John, I can't get to practice. My car won't leave the driveway. And he'd be like, all right, I'll be there in five minutes. I'd be like, oh, <laughs> I have to go to practice. <laughs> but he'd come and pick me up. He would not let me fail. He would, he would not let me fail. And I just remember learning the value of like someone who believes in you with everything that they are and what kind of power that has. So. That's kind of where that is, I think. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I know you maybe don't want to admit this, but what's one good piece of advice that your brothers actually gave you? Oh, gosh. Let's see. My big brothers. If they ever find out that you, you know, obviously they gave you some good advice, maybe you won't hear the end of it, but... Oh, no, you know, I'll tell you. I, I, the reason I started swimming is because I wanted to be like my brothers, and the, it, it is still true. My brothers are fantastic people. They're, my brother Fritz is... Got his PhD in fluid dynamics, like shocker swimmer fluids. <laughs> right, yeah. And, um, my brother Ed is a, got an exercise physiology degree, and he's a self-taught engineer. He's been at HP for years, like 18 years. My brother Charles is a systems analyst for the government. Like, my brothers are so smart, and they're so amazing. And um, you know, even though we, I think part of what I learned from them was was about like team and family. You know, because. I remember they could give me crap all day. They could, you know, make fun of me and tease me and poke me and break my hair off in New Hampshire when it was really cold and make me cry. <laughs> but when anybody else stepped into the fray, like if anybody made fun of me who wasn't my brothers, they would, to a, to a man, they would get rid of that threat. You know, I remember at the bus stop, one of our neighbors was giving me a hard time, and my brother threw him in the in the, in the snowbank head first. So, you know, very you can, yes, they're very protective. They can, you can have your own things, but you keep it inside, right? And the love and the bonding that's there. My brothers, you know, I I give them a hard time, but and they give me a hard time, but we love each other so much, and uh, they're incredible, wonderful human beings and great men, all yeah. of them. So, BJ, you talked about, obviously, when you swim for that long, when you're a professional athlete for that long, yeah. when you stopped swimming professionally, what was that like? 
Um, well, I told you, I still wake up and uh, I'm scared that I'm late for practice. Like I, and for some reason, it's Mark Schubert's voice. <laughs> Mark Schubert's the one I'm afraid is calling me. Um, but I, uh, I think that it takes a lot to figure out who you are without a sport. And I think that for me, my career, I, went, I started working for Nike after I finished swimming. And that was, it was almost like a crutch uh, to give myself you know, a way to stay in the sport without having to swim. Or it's a good transition. To it was. It was a really good transition because it allowed me to kind of take a baby step outside of the womb. And then, uh, you know, at a certain point, I decided I wanted to see if my brain worked. You know, if it didn't have to be high on BJ, you might recognize me from such things as the Olympics. To on the Wheaties I, box. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was never on the Wheaties box. I, I, I thought I was going to be, but yeah, I wasn't. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, that now I, I work in software and. Um, it's so fun and it's so interesting, it's so dynamic, but it, it did, it took me a really long time and it was really painful to do something that I didn't know everything about because I'd been in something for so long that I was really an undeniable expert at, at, and, and kind of a heavy hitter in that world and then to just say, all right, I, I gotta go, I gotta go try something else. Um, so I think there's a, a masochistic part of me that just has to go and Start at the bottom and figure something out. Um, so, so what do you use in your training that translates directly to business for you? That makes it such an easy transition? Because I'm sure it's tough in a lot of ways, but there's probably a lot of things that you take that translates directly to, to business that make yeah. you, makes you, you know, uh, achieve more. Yeah, well, I think um, I, I am an eternal learner. Um, even to the end of my swimming, I, I still was learning things. I was still learning new ways of swimming or trying to learn new ways. So I will always come at something not with I know everything, but with, okay, I don't know. So what do you know? Can, can we work together to win? And I think that that team mentality, even with an individual sport, like really the team mentality of how can we all win? You know, what if this isn't a finite system? What if it's something that's bigger than that? How do we all win? Um, that's something that's really kind of been ingrained in me in sports. Um, really simple things, be on time. Do what you say you're going to do. And if you can't be there, communicate. <laughs> you know, get ahead of things and, and don't, uh, don't let people down. And if you do, because it'll happen, especially if you make big promises, figure out, you know, come clean figure out where you fell short and how you can fix it in the future and make another promise. Um, and, I, and I feel like if you do those things as a, on a team, you're going to be a leader and you're going to be a good teammate. And in business, you're going to be a leader and you're going to be a good teammate. And those are the things that I think in American business is what we need. You know, Because it's not just about making money, it's about saving this planet because somebody's got to. So. Yeah. Yeah, BJ, and I, I watched another interview that you did, and yeah. you, and I think someone else had said the same thing, and, and you mentioned this, that people keep telling you that you need to write a book. So if there was a book, let's say, and the title was, let's say, How to Be Best in the World, mm -hmm. what would be some of the things that you would put put in there? Well, I definitely think um, that the one message that I would shout from every you know chapter heading would be surround yourself with people who believe in your dreams more than you do. Um, that is the easiest way that I've found because I don't, you won't hold yourself accountable every day. You won't. You don't. Um, so if you have, and it's a heck of a lot easier to be inspired by someone else than it is by yourself. So look to other people to be that source of inspiration to keep you going. And when you do that, even if you don't achieve your dream, you will be a lot further ahead on the road. And that way, you know, with any luck, it never ends. You just keep going, right? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Um, and so, one last question, BJ. I appreciate your time on this. This is just hugely valuable. Um, okay. Obviously, I think I was reading on social media. You know, you obviously are an Olympic swimmer, mm -hmm. businesswoman, and I thought you said wonderful wife and mom. So, wh how has that translated and influenced you raising your kids? Oh, you know, it's I, I don't know, uh, you know, because we're still in the midst of that, right? Um, my kids are seven and nine, 
So, gosh, hopefully, you know, when they're older, they can tell me that they turned out okay. <laughs> uh, but are I they was swimmers? Say, they are both on the swim team right now. Um, they. So do you tell them? What do you tell them if they're like, I um, want to be an Olympic athlete? What would you tell them? Because it's obviously not an easy journey. Yeah, my daughter says it a lot. She's like, I want to go to the Olympics like mom. And I'm like, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. You know, I don't want to tell. I mean, I, I'm like, well, you do that. I will support you the whole way, but it is not an easy journey, and it will it will fight you, and you will love it, and you will hate it. But if you love it, and you just you know keep loving it, then it'll take care of itself. Um, I I fought for a while against letting my daughter join the swim team. <laughs> I know it's so bad, um, but I believe it. I mean, I could see definitely because you know too much. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, can't you do something that I don't know everything about, like soccer? Like, did you kick the ball today, honey? Was that fun? You know, um, or baseball? Like, woo! I don't know. Like, I but I, uh, I know everything about swimming. So for the longest time, Arden was like, I want to swim. I want to swim. I want to swim. Let me have some team, mommy. I can do it right now. And I'm like, you you can't make a lap. Like, it's not gonna work out. Like, oh. <laughs> but she was so adamant. And at one point, she looked at me and goes. Mommy, don't you just wish you could live underwater? And I was like, okay, this is about me. This is not about her. Like, I gotta let go. I gotta let it go. So, um, I did, and she loves it. You know, I mean, she's. I, I don't know if she's the swimmer that I was. Um, she, but she loves it. She just loves the water, and that that's the big thing. I mean, she just loves the water, and so I can't fight with her on that. Um, and my son wants to be just like Ar her. Like Bronson just wants to be do whatever Arden does. So he goes chasing after her. Um, so we'll see. I mean, my husband was a pro BMX guy, so he's he was he would love for them to do. In the jeans. Yeah. I know. Well, they're gonna be. They can do sports if they want to. But really, we're so both Tom and I did our sports at such a high level that we're 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 the opposite of pushy. We're like. Do what you want. I mean, and, and I do like the rule that if you sign up for it and we've paid for it, you're going to finish out that cycle that we paid for. And after that, you can make it whatever choice you want. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, that's the only thing. I mean, we just we try not to push. We lived our dreams. We don't need to do it through them. Yeah. We just want them to find something they're passionate about and they love that will help them to be better people. Yeah. And the last piece of my question, BJ, is you've created a couple organizations, Arden's Friends yeah. and the Art and a Wish. So I wanted yeah. you to talk to, talk about that and tell what inspired those. Sure. So I have done some work with an organization called the Landmark, Landmark Education, Landmark Worldwide. I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, so Landmark, uh, for the Self-Expression and Leadership Program, uh, they have you uh, do a project, which is really where Arden's, uh, Arden's Friends and the Art and a Wish came from. And the Art and a Wish was, I was really pretty passionately committed to and still remain uh, committed to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Um, so I created a way, and I, I have an art background, so I was like, let's see if I can partner something up to create something so that we can donate money to Make-A-Wish. So I created this thing, this foundation of art and, art, the art and a Wish, and that ended up being taken over by the Thomas Kincaid Foundation. And what it did is it paired artists with Wish Kids. And their creation would then get sold at auction, and mm. uh, and bring in some money for the at that point the Colorado Springs um, Make a Wish Foundation. I, after it was all completed, they said it ended up paying for like two or three wishes. Wow, so, that's amazing. Oh, I know. Congratulations I was on that. So blown away. That's probably like the nicest thing I've ever done. <laughs> um, and then Arden's friends, my daughter is on the autism spectrum. She's got Asperger's, and mm. so that was really about. Um, Finding a, a kind of a, a a community support system for kids on the spectrum, mm -hmm. and uh, it's still kind of a work in progress. It it almost morphed into helping parents to navigate the school situation. Like when you have a kid on the on the spectrum, how do you work with schools to? Because um, I ran into a lot of problems just with the lack of resources in our educational system today. How, how do you? Help teachers help your kid because no teacher wants to, you know, have a kid who struggles. And I mean, that's not why you get into teaching, right? It's you, you love kids. And my daughter is super loving and great, but she has to 
hear things in a certain way or she thinks about them in different ways. So working with teachers and schools to be able to um, create an environment where they can be successful was what that one was about. So yeah, those are hmm. those were kind of inspired through my landmark experience. Um, I was coaching one of the programs as well there, so that was where Arden's friends came into being. Yeah. BJ, this has been truly amazing. I just want to thank you so much. Thank you for for doing this. Yeah, thank you for the interview. It was really fun. You glad I didn't. I'm, I'm wearing uh, mascara, so crying was I, was I was a little close a couple times, but. <laughs> Held it back. <laughs> so, thank, you, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. A clean sweep for the American women on the relays and a world record. Jenny, we need a calculator almost for your medals now. Ten Olympic medals. It seems like a perfect way to go out. Is this it? Yeah, this is a really special way to end. We smashed the world record. It's really exciting. BJ's little flip was cool too. I like that. I meant, I meant an end more personally for you. You're going to retire after this? Uh, I think I'll still a little more. I don't know if I'll do another Olympics, but we'll see. Jerry, you're right behind with nine medals. Now, if I have my figures right, you won your first medal in the Olympics about the same time that Megan was born. <laughs> what does this say about this team? I hear that all the time. It means that we have a great team, but it also shows that, um, you know, you don't have to be a young teenager to swim fast. And Megan, you get to take these medals back to school. Are you going to show them off? I'm going to show everyone. <laughs> show and tell. BJ, you waited so long for this. You look like you're about to bust and you swam your personal best. How great is this for you? Oh, I'm so excited. And all, we, all I know is we just brought home a world record for the United States of America. <laughs> Congratulations, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, man. So the American women crushed the world record and probably also set some kind of demographic record. Two distinct generations of U.S. swimmers combining, ranging from 16-year-old Megan Kwan to 33-year-old Dara Torres. Here is their medal ceremony out at the Aquatic Center. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the national anthem of the United States of America. A total of 22 Olympic medals on that podium. Thompson now owns 10, eight of them gold in Olympic history. The only woman with more golds than Jenny is the great Soviet gymnast of the 50s and 60s, Larissa Latinina. She won nine. Torres, seven years away from the pool, returns to win five medals here in Sydney, three individual bronze, two relay gold.